I forget what date it is on the calendar that you have, but I think we have the next quantum or the physics, quantum physics meeting here, the third, is it the third Saturday or Sunday? I don't know what it is. Sunday. Wednesday this month? No. Sunday. It's Sunday this month and then Wednesday the next. And basically, it's a very interesting thing to consider quantum physics in the light of our spiritual discoveries because many of the things that you learned as a child when you went to church concerned the invisible, the what we called spiritual. But now you find out that a lot of the things that are active and impact on us are invisible, but they're called subatomic. And in order to understand how these things work, you get into a realm called quantum physics. And quantum physics is a study of people minds and thing minds, which creates a whole new thought process for us, because what are thing minds? We never considered before thing minds. I mean, people minds, each of you have a mind and you think, but now we get into quantum physics, we find out that the things that we didn't realize think, think. Like light. Light thinks. And that's impossible for you to accept that, that light thinks. Only because you don't understand quantum. But quantum says that light will decide when it has a choice which is the best route to take. How? Because it has a consciousness. Regardless of whether you or I understand that, that's, the physicists tell us that. And so not only if you consider that light thinks, then you have electrons that think. And electrons that think are not only outside in the universe, they're inside of your body. And this begins the, the old light and darkness, positive and negative, yin-yang, because in a nucleus you have an electron which is negative, a proton which is positive, and then you have something that doesn't have a charge which is called a neutron. And all of these things are not only in the universe, but they're inside of you, and they think. And so the only difference between you and what's in the universe is you're attached to the body that you have. But once you separate and detach from that body, you're part of that cosmic whole and that cosmic intelligence. When you turn on your television set, millions of ghosts leave the tube and head out. Ghosts. Folks say that's ridiculous. Well, it's maybe ridiculous, but it's true. Each electron that exits from the tube to smack the screen, there's only one that does, but each of them, billions of them, have a ghost attached to them, and a the ghost decides we're going to go to the left, going to go to the right, going to go up or down. And also, the amazing fact is that when you look at, or try to look at an atom, you immediately change it, just by looking at it. It changes simply by your observation. So, <laughs> these are amazing things, which finally in 19, I guess it was 1900, Max Planck was his name, I guess from Germany, discovered what we know as quantum physics, which throughout, see, like classical physics says that you'll have an answer to your question, and it will either be yes or no. But quantum physics says, the answer will be your experience. You have an experience. Gary Zukov has wrote this book called The Dancing Wooly Masters. It's spelled W-U-L-I. And Wu Li is Chinese, and it means the movement of energy, but it also means enlightened. But the Wooly method, the, the teachers of, of this philosophy or science, whatever you want to call it, John, said so you don't teach quantum, and you don't study quantum, you dance with it. And that basically is your meditation, and, and that's why so many of us get so frustrated in meditation, because we're trying to study it, we're trying to figure out how to do it, but these masters say, no, you don't do that in meditation, you just dance with it. And when you go into meditation to dance, you should never lead because you're the bride. Let the bridegroom lead you in the dance. 
Let the music play, let the sound swirl, and let the bridegroom who's inside of you, which is the Christ figure, just sweep you off onto this cosmic ballroom and dance. And it sounds a little uh, Disney-esque, but nonetheless, it's very beautiful and very true. Sorry. I had a conversation, I was telling the folks f f uh, the other night, Tuesday night, I was telling them, I had a conversation with a friend of ours from New York City who's a Sufi Muslim. And we got into a lot of discussions about a lot of things, and he's very, you know, he's a wonderful person to listen to talk, as, m as most of these Sufi Muslims are. And he said, you know, it is the mother in each one of us that is the fulfillment of our meditation. It's Pia Mater. And he says, even when you go to a wedding, think about it. There are two mothers getting married. The mother and the man and the mother and the woman. And they dance and they embrace. And he says, that's why they call it matrimony and not patrimony. It always has been that way because it's the wedding, the coming together of the mothers. So there's so many beautiful things. I mean, we know so much. We have a nuclear plant down here. We know so much about atoms. We know so much about all of these types of things and the power that atoms have and what they do and how they do it and so forth and so on. But in all of that, in all of the knowledge we have of the power, consider the fact that no human being, no human being has ever seen one. And, th and the things that they do, religious people will say, the devil did it. Well, they're saying the devil did it because they, th this unseen, invisible power. Gary Zukov in his book said, if hydrogen atoms didn't do it, then maybe the devil did. <laughs> so, when we begin to understand that there is an entire source of energy and living intelligence that surrounds you, that the thinking goes on outside of you by thinking things, in addition to thinking people. Then you come to this point where we are in our, what we're studying now and saying, hey, now that I begin to understand the uh, nature of the world, the earth, the universe, the cosmos, now that I begin to understand that everything that is within the universe has a consciousness and thinks, that atoms think, electrons think, light thinks, that everything then I, then I realize that I'm not separated from it at all because all of those things that are whirling around are inside of me whirling around. They're the same things. So then I, I start to say, maybe it's time then to look at, at these mysterious things written in, in scriptures and say, are they, are they speaking to me about a scientific truth that I can be part of rather than some religious stuff that is simply going to coerce me into some kind of a tribal mentality. And so we came to the point where we're on the eve of announcing, I think October 23rd they're announcing the next planet. That's what it says on the computers. So we're on the eve of the announcement. Albert, okay? We're on the eve of the announcement that the seventh planet is in the constellation Leo, right where it should be. I mean, you know, you, 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 you go around and, and, and you have Bibles in your hands and you get into astrology and astronomy and all of these things. You know about the Kundalini? You know about the rising from the solar to the pineal gland? You know that in order to move from the solar to the pineal gland, you first have to begin at virgin consciousness, separation from thought, out-of-body experiences, all of that kind of business and meditation. So you have to go from the virgin mind to the pineal gland, which is represented by Leo, which is also the riddle of the Sphinx the face of the virgin, the body of the lion. The beginning from nothingness to Christ consciousness. And so here then in October 1995 they started discovering these planets with sun stars which was never seen before. And where did they find the first one? After Pegasus which was the declaration they found the first one in Virgo. 
the virgin. And where have they found the seventh? In Leah. And so here then the riddle of the Sphinx is fulfilled in the cosmos. It's fulfilled in you. It's exactly the same. And so it's an exciting, it's an exciting time because all of this is happening. The amazing thing to me is that most people have no idea that it's happening. I don't know how many of you had an opportunity to see the Learning Channel the other night about the Sphinx. Yes. What they are able to do is prove by calculations that the Sphinx in Egypt was constructed, are you ready for this, 10,500 years ago. That's 8,000 years before there was an Egypt. And that at the time that the Sphinx was built, the sun was in the sign Leo. So, you know, the, the astronomical implications not only of the Sphinx, but its positioning with the three of the pyramids, of, you know, Giza and so forth and so on, it's, it's an astronomical wonder, but 10,500 years ago. I mean, we got m most religious people in Christianity don't even believe there was a world 10,500 years ago because it says in here that Adam was running around with fig leaves for 6,000 years ago. So we begin to understand and we begin to learn. So and I brought you to this situation because now that we're discovering the seventh planet, which is a significant discovery, if indeed you understand what kundalini is and the energy rises from your solar plexus to the pineal gland of your brain and that movement of the seven. If you understand the movement of the sun and realize that it rises out of the winter solstice in December up to April and May for, through the seven until we get from winter to spring and then you realize that the sun rises at the solar plexus up to the pineal of the seven, now you've got the situation of the discovery of these new planets which have never been seen before with sun, and we have seven. And the seventh one, impactful. I mean, is all of this a coincidence? Is all of this a coincidence that it, it winds up in Leo? I mean, everything has, as we've, we've taken you through step by step to each planetary discovery, everything has fit exactly where it was placed here in this book. The only thing is we, we just have never been able to grasp this thing. We've been frightened by religious people of our very nature, our minds, our, our universe, and we're saying, stay away, don't, don't meditate, don't go into your mind, oh, don't look at the stars, don't get into any of that stuff. And what have we done? The Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So I brought you here a few weeks ago to the point at in our instruction, our next movement as we study quantum and so forth and so on, is that we're preparing to open the seven seals. Now, would you take your car engine apart? Certainly not. Why? Because you never know how to get it back together again, for one thing, and if you take it apart, when you step on the gas, if it was me, the thing would explode. You wouldn't know. You can't do something like that. Would you take your television apart? Take it apart and clean the wires. Would you take your telephone apart? Absolutely not. You wouldn't play with any of this stuff. And yet people would want to sit down and, and, and get the kundalini and all of this stuff to start happening in their minds and have enough clue what to do with it. Having a clue what it's about, where it comes from, how it's interrelated with physics, how it's interrelated with the electricity of the cosmos, they have no idea. You think there's just electricity in you? That electricity in you is attached to an electric source in the universe, electromagnetic fields. And I mean, it's not a, all of these names, religious names, spiritual names, I, have, I mean, there's, there's something you have to understand. And so we got to the point of realizing that there's Revelation chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6, which covers the stimulation of this, what they call kundalini, this electricity that flows up the seven chakras. And we're in Revelation chapter 4. And in Revelation chapter 4, if you turn up, if you have one of those Bibles, to page 1004, we will do a little synopsis because what have we learned so far? The first thing that you learned so far was that there's a door open, which means there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity for you 
to get involved in this. There's an opportunity for you to flow in this. But that doesn't mean that because you come into a church, you check your brains at the door. All of a sudden, you're very intelligent people, you know. You have computers, you went to school. How many of you went to school? Most of you, I'll bet. Because I see you got pens and you can write. I see you look down at the book, unless you're kidding, you can read. So I mean, most of you went to school. But yet you'll come into churches and sit there and listen to them tell you the most bizarre tales in the world of, of, of fish swallowing people and people getting pregnant without having sex and all this kind of stuff. And you say, oh, that's right, glory to God, I believe that. You know you don't. <laughs> you believe any of it, because it's silly. And it shouldn't be silly because God created a magnificent universe which requires at least a degree of intelligence to function in it. I mean, they don't even let you ride a car without a license. Why? Because you're supposed to know what you're doing. But yet we can come into these churches and absorb, absorb ourselves with these bizarre people with costumes on and pointed hats and they're telling us all this weird stuff. They got the windows painted and all these things. And we think it's wonderful. This is wonderful because we've never settled down to think. So here now there's an opportunity. You see it in Revelation 4, when a door opened. Remember we, then we started, we, they talked to us about the trumpet, which we know is ohm. So there's a connection there of electrical energy, I even spell it that way, of electrical energy that flows through your spine. That's what the trumpet. Then there was, a, then there was the, the, the jasper and the sardine, and the jasper is white, which is consciousness. Separation from thought. The sardine is red, which is the emotion. So here now we've had the opportunity. We have the understanding that there's a movement of electrical energy involved in this. We, we understand the necessary uh, need for purifying the mind of consciousness, of thought, and involving our emotional nature in it as well. And there is an emotional involvement in this. You feel it. You feel the tingling sensations. I have people come up to me at the end of the meditation and say, oh, that was a beautiful one or whatever. Your emotions do get involved in it. And then there was a re reference to emerald. And emerald is green. And emerald represents the astral body. And the astral body is that point between you and what you call your spirit, your electrical realm. That's what makes you think. All of your thoughts, there's not one thought in your head. Not one of the thoughts. Or close your eyes for a second. Think of the house you lived in when you were a child. Can you see it? Where did that come from? You can instantly bring it to bear out of a memory bank, but where did it come from? Sure, your brain makes it through the wiring, makes it available to you in the physical realm, but where was that stored? And there's no doctor in the world that can open your head and find a picture of that house. There's no doctor in the world that can take all of your loves and fears and hates and aspirations and they're not in you, they're in the astral body and it's that emerald, that's what it was telling us about. And then we had the rainbow bridge. And the rainbow bridge, which is thin as a razor, say the Buddhists, and crossing that rainbow bridge is, is, is the willingness to walk alone. And I'll tell you something, there is nobody in the world who's attached to any religious group can ever get this. You have to be alone. You have to be free. You have to be that unique, special individual you are. Any of the problems that you've ever had in your life, any of the heartbreaks that you've ever had in your life is because you were associated with somebody or something. Everything that's ever gone wrong has gone wrong because you were trying to live up to somebody else's expectations. Every time. And the person that you're trying to live up to, they're trying to live up to somebody else's. And so we have the rainbow bridge, which is the seven colors of the rainbow represent the seven chakras. And then we had crowns of consciousness. And then last week they talked about the four and twenty elders. And when we talked about the four and twenty, it immediately connected us to the cosmos. Because if you go out and you look at that map, and we showed you last week, the map of right ascension, the way we measured it, is measured in 24. You start at 1 and go to 24, so immediately. And you, why do they say 4 and 20? Because 4 is you, 20 is the universe. 4 is your physical, intellectual, spiritual, and emotional, connected to the 20. And it combines as the 4 and 20 or the 24, which you'll see on that star map if you go out there. 
And then last week we had lightnings, which is understanding, sudden enlightenment, and thunders, which is that shaking inside of you that says something has happened, something has changed. And then voices, it says, voices being that which is inst the instructions that you receive. Somehow you know what to do. And then we had last week the seven lamps lit by the fire. You can go to a Jewish house and you can see the lamp. It's got seven candles on it. Why? Because when the solar fire rises from your solar plexus, as it goes through each chakra, it lights it. Those are the seven lamps. Those are the seven candles. Until it finally rises up and hits the pineal gland. In the same way that the sun rises up and hits Aries and spring bursts forth. And so that's where we've gotten, and, and, and so we have, a, not only are we instructed, before you touch these seals, before you start opening and fooling around with these seven seals, understand what's involved here. You've got a tremendous opportunity given to you, but you've got to son, uh, understand that it is you, it is your mind, it is the need to purge your mind of thought, and it is the need for you to realize that you have to be connected to that which is the universe, the electricity of the universe. And you want to do that. And, and you'll get people running up and down here with robes on, whatever, telling you, don't do that. Don't get involved in that stuff. And they've made a mess of the world and the earth and the people and the animals. So on page 1004, and you get to Revelation chapter 4, and we'll continue. Revelation chapter 4, and you get to verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. So you get three ideas to consider here now. There's three more things. See, this is the boring part of it. You want to get in and just open the seals. You don't really care whether you know what to do with it when you open them. What are you going to do when you open it and sit now? What are you going to do? Oh, I don't know what to do because you didn't pay any attention. <laughs> See? And that's what, that's what, that's why this was written this way. There's two chapters before you get to opening the seals. Revelation chapter 6, you'll open the seals, but 4 and 5 is say, hey, this is, this is what this is all about. So pay attention because when you start opening the box and something jumps out, you want to know what to do with it. <laughs> and it will. It'll jump out. Might be that guy who's going to look at you and say, what's the symbol? What's the name? What's the number? Everybody's been trying to open these seals. David Koresh tried to open these seals and burn the whole place down. Because he didn't know. He hadn't a clue. He hadn't a clue. So here we have three things to consider now as we consider, as we continue our movement towards this. Three things considered, they're connected with consciousness. You have the sea, you have glass, and you have crystal. Three ideas. And the sea can either be raging or it can be calm. The sea can either be raging or calm. Raging, it is a symbol of your churning emotional nature. Have, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have recently been through a period when the sea was raging? Sure, I understand. But at the same point now, after you've come through that raging sea, and whenever you're going through the raging sea, if you're like me, you just get up on the poop deck and start screaming. There is nobody in the world say everything's going to be all right because the water is coming on top of you. There's a leak in the bow. The ship is going down. You're standing on it. And somebody says, don't worry. <laughs> the only point at that time, the only thing you can do is just hang on to the mast and just hope. But then you understand that you get into meditation and now... You're on a very calm sea, and it's beautiful. It's like a crystal. What happened? Well, now you go back into the books that you used to read. And remember, there's a Christ consciousness, there's a Jesus, whatever you want to call it. There's an energy that when you touch it in your meditation, says to the churning sea, peace, be still. Be still. And so the raging stops. But here the sea is like glass. The, the, what's going on, the personality, the environment, it's like glass, it's calm. So here we're being told that our pre-seal opening time is a time of meditative serenity. It is a time of calmness. Be still. These are the most beautiful things, if you ever look out on the 
You ever get, you know, one of these condos when you're on Myrtle Beach or someplace for a week and you look out your window or on your balcony and you look out at the ocean night and, and the moon looks down on it and it's all, it's beautiful. It's calm. Sorry. So the mind condition that you need to be into before you get to opening these seals is compared to the sea. It's massive. It's not any way controllable as is the earth. You can control the earth, but not the sea. Has immense power, see. But it's calm. See, so, so, so this is what you realize that the raging sea is your mind, <laughs> and the calm sea is the right hemisphere, the Christ consciousness. Now, if you look at, at verse 6 again, the symbolism is glass like crystal. What comes in? What should come in? What is crystal? Crystal filters. When a light comes through, a white light comes through crystal. White light comes through glass. You know what comes out the other end of a prism? All different colors. Why? Because white light is not white. It's made up of all of these colors. That red shirt that you've got on, it's not red. That's the light that makes the colors. And so here then we see that the filter of the properties of crystal will filter out, what is it? Fear? Where does the fear come from? Were you born with fear? No. You weren't born with fear. When you plopped out on that tray and the doctor did whatever they do, what were you afraid of? You weren't fearful. That was built into you. Your loving family. Your church. All the people that were going to take care of you. Scared the hell out of you. And you were raised with fear. We were talking about last night. I mean, you know, I weren't going to go into my but that was I lived in the house of hearts. I lived in a fear factory when I was a kid. Guilt. You're nothing but a worthless sinner. All of your righteousness is like filthy rags. You've heard that. No matter what you do, it's not good. Who told you that? The church. So all of these things then, and what do they do to you? They make you sick. They work at you from inside and they gnaw at you and they make you sick. And some people get so sick that they wind up in a hospital. If we didn't have religion, we wouldn't even need hospitals. Because people would not get near as sick as they do. From fear, and guilt come all of these different diseases. They break down your immune system. They break down your resistance. And it's all this garbage that's poured into people's heads. Okay. But what does crystal do? What's the word? You know the word. Azozio. And what's the word zeo? There's a chemical. Zeolite. And what does zeolite do? Filters the scum out of all of the water. And what is azolite? Where did I get this from? Just some strange thing that came out of some cosmic thing that Joan Schultz facts? Oh, no. <laughs> comes in Webster's International Dictionary. The light that is filtered by crystal. And so that's what you want to do when your meditation brings you to this point of calmness. Then this crystal light filters out all of this kind of stuff that has made you sick and has hurt you. So crystal is pure knowledge, understanding from the source of all power, filtered away. Let's take a look at a couple of things. When we, t when we studied UFOs a few weeks ago, remember we went to Ezekiel and he saw the UFO and he saw the man get out of the UFO in the white suit and go underneath and, and check the ground and the ground was scorched and then the, then the guy got back into the UFO and it took off. This is in the Bible. We read all of this. And then it hovered over and, and Ezekiel said that that UFO was God. That's in the Bible. But I want to show you something interesting. Go to page 678, if you would. 
And on page 678, if you look at the book of Ezekiel, and in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 22, Ezekiel is describing the UFO. And he said, and the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature, well, it says the color of the terrible crystal. So he connects a crystal to the UFO. I'd say, well, what could that possibly mean? Well, we don't even know what UFOs are because, you know, our knowledge is based totally uh, on a scientific basis instead of on a uh, basis of um, consciousness and where they come from, how they come from within, and so forth and so on. So here there's an attachment. Ezekiel attached cherubims to them, and we found that cherubims were part of the mind, and now he's attaching crystal to a UFO. So in other words, what we found out in the Bible, that there is more to UFO than what we've even seen with all of these people that go on Channel 5 or sightings and all of that stuff, know nothing about this, that there's a much deeper aspect to this than that, that they're manufactured on the basis of consciousness. You create them, and this is where you get into quantum physics and understand that you, by your observation, something appears or doesn't appear. By your observation, something disappears. And by the thoughts of your mind, once you understand how this all works, you create. It doesn't mean something's not there. It just means somebody else can't see, which you can. We'll, go, we'll get to that. So you have to think in the realm of Azozio to understand these things. All of these thoughts have to be filtered away. All of these things that you say, well, this couldn't be or that couldn't be, all of that stuff has to be filtered out of your, out of your thought process. And then you, uh, you, you can get to the point where you start thinking, wait a minute here, I got a Bible in my hand, I see on television about UFOs, but now I'm reading about it in the Bible, and what's being said here is there's a connection not only to uh, what I'm being taught as far as the seals and the seven seals and the kundalini, but the seals and the seven seals and the kundalini, the aspect of crystal, is also attached to the UFO. And with the four and twenty, the fourfold nature in the Kundalini, what we're studying now, is also attached, as you'll see, that in reading Ezekiel, that the creatures had four faces, which were the four primary zodiacal signs, the face of the lion, the eagle, the man, and the uh, bull. Taurus, Scorpio, Leo, and who's the other one? Aquarius. Okay. So let's go back to 1004 and plow through this. We're not too far from chapter 5, and, you know, but we're not going to rush it. What's the rush? Where are you going? You know, it's amazing. Where the heck are you going? You're, you're, you, you, can you leave the planet? can't leave the planet, so you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Your planet is going 40,000 miles an hour, and nobody's driving it, and you're sitting on here, and you're going to go somewhere, or you're looking for security. You're going any night lower. It's like a flea on a tennis ball. Okay, Revelation 4, 6, and in the midst of the throne, around about the throne, were what? Four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So here we had the crystal and the connection with uh, the UFO and the connection with the Kundalini inside of you. The four beasts are the four compass points, north, south, east, and west. The four beasts are the fourfold nature, emotions, Spirit, physical, intellect, okay? The four beasts are uh, the four tribes, the four primary tribes. Reuben, Judah, Dan, Ephraim. So in other words, when you read about Ephraim in the Bible, you should be able to understand that you're reading about the aspect of the West, the intellect. Dan, you're reading about the emotions in the North. Judah, you're reading about the spirit in the East. And Reuben, you're reading about the physical in the South. See, Judah parks at the point of the rising sun in the East. 
Remember, there's 186,400 people in there, according to the Bible. That's the constant speed of light. Now, what is it that blocks out the light of the sun? Happens every day. Every day you've been alive, it's happened. The west. The sun goes down in the west. So what is it that blocks out the sun? What is it that blocks out the spirit? Your brain, the intellect. Oh, I don't think that could be. My pastor said I shouldn't listen to this stuff. I'll go to hell. So that's it. So you don't do it. And what, 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 the way it's put together like this, that it is that which comes from the west that blocks out that which is of the east. So all of these things then become part of the atmosphere that you live in, the sociality that you take part in. The word beast is indicative of the animal nature. So if you had people in, in Israel in the Bible for years killing animals. They still do, some of these people. They kill a little lamb, and they kill a bird, or they'll hit some goat over the head, and they'll take a chicken, and so on. They kill a chicken and figure, okay, all the scuzzy things I've done all my life, that's all paid for by the blood of the chicken. Bark, 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 and that's it. Come in. Can, you, can you conceive of how, what the, where did we come from? How did we ever, how did we ever get to this point? Here we have, you know, we talk about studying quantum physics and all this stuff, and we have people that are extremely intellectual. You're extremely intellectual. I sit down and talk to all of you people, and, and I know myself. I feel I've got, you know, fairly good grasp on things. But I used to go to these places and sit and listen to this stuff, too. And I wave my hand every once in a while. Hallelujah. What am I doing? For what? So the four beasts are these compass points, the, the connection to the human condition. We've connected it to the four and twenty-four, which is the cosmic condition. Now we're connecting it through the, the seven, is connected to the beast. You ready? All the stories you've read about, all the stories in the Bible, come back to one point. It's just like Hare Krishna, born of a virgin, the wicked king going to kill all the children. Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, the wicked king going to kill all the children. Same story. Nobody robbed it. The Christians didn't rob the story from the Hindus. It's the same story. It's given to everybody. It's like the hundred monkey theory. One monkey cleans his, his, his nuts or whatever they clean in one lake and then around the other end of the world some other monkey's cleaning his and everybody's, uh, you know. So, on you go. Is it? It's not a dish. A monkey doesn't have a dish. He's not cleaning his dish. They have stuff. Clean his face, then. Uh, all right. Page five. I always know how to wake you up, anyhow. I say, yeah, I wake you up. It's still the hundred monkey theory, and whoever it is. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you. Why don't you explain it? All right, let me let me let me gingerly explain it. A monkey goes into the water and cleans something. Another monkey on the other side of the world goes into the water and cleans the same thing. The two monkeys never communicated. It's like all of the cultures in the world have a Noah story, yet they never communicate, and they all have this kind of story. Because these are stories of consciousness. We're talking about the beast. You know that the, the movement of the energy through the chakras goes through seven chakras. Whether that's just myth, uh, you know, spiritual or whatever, metaphysical, that's irrelevant, but that's the way it's, it's set up. Through the seven chakras, so the beast is cleansed by the fire going through the seven chakras until it hits the pineal gland and so forth and so on. Now let me show you something on page five in the Bible. Go to page five, Genesis chapter seven. And in Genesis chapter seven, on page five, if you look at this, okay? In Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, of every clean beast you shall take to you by sevens. See? Now, what you've been taught as a child all of your life is that this fool had a boat and he brought 
every two of every kind. They didn't, you didn't even know the part about the sevens. You always thought there was two of every. Okay? But the two of every is the unclean thing. The seven of the clean you brought back. So he had, you know, all kinds. But the seven beasts are clean means that the energy has flowed from you from the solar plexus through the seven chakras impacting the pineal gland and cleans out the bestial nature or the animal nature of the brain. I, I, I know this is a shock and I know this is not easy to take, but let me just lay it on you anyhow. Do you realize that the story of Noah's Ark is a myth and that it never happened? <laughs> you know, try to handle it, you know. It is all it is a beautiful, wonderful, important story about the ark that sits on your shoulders and the ark that sits on your shoulders is that point of consciousness. And you take this energy by sevens, you rise upward and you take into this ark yourself. And those are the things that soar. The, the, the spiritual thoughts and the wild things, the wild thoughts and, and the domestic things, the domestic thoughts. And you take them by twos, the positive and negative. You take them into the ark. And the storm that comes upon you while you're in that ark will make you shake. But it says, stay in the ark. And there's no windows in the ark so that you can't look on anything. So you're in meditation. Only one window in the ark is so that you look up. And when the storm has finally abated, when all of these symbolic numbers take their effect, the ark rests and you're resting on the mountaintop and you step out of the ark onto solid ground and you are free. And all this has ever meant are people trying to figure out how a guy could get it, two of every kind of animal in the world in a boat and be there for 40 days while they're all going to the bathroom. <laughs> Who's cleaning this thing? There ain't no windows in here. What kind of God is this? Hey, it's funny because it's silly, but this is part of the foundation of your culture. And you send your kids to these Sunday schools to hear this stuff. You can't miss this, Gerard. Glory to God. <laughs> God will be mad if you don't hear about this. <laughs> now, uh, page 1004, Revelation 4. Uh, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6. And it says, And full, the four beasts were full of eyes before and behind. What would that symbolize? It symbolizes perception. You can see. Do you know what a lot of you have now? An understanding of what this stuff meant from the past. You can see behind. Eyes in front. Behind is the understanding of what went before. You understand that the atom is, is nuclear fission, that it was no such guy as that. You understand about the construction of the temple. And you understand about all the things that you and I have discussed before. So you see behind of all the things that took place and you have an understanding. And now you're understanding what's coming. You have eyes behind you that say, oh, I understand what they meant now, what they're telling me. You have eyes in front of you. You understand what's coming and you do. You're waiting. You're waiting on the edge of your seat. You're waiting for the, the, that full announcement of the seventh planet. You're waiting to find out what happens when they find the eighth planet. You're waiting for the fulfillment of 4555, which you know is a galaxy. I was with people last night, and uh, folks that are religious people, spiritual people, that go to a denominational church, and I told them, we've got God's address in case you want to send them a card. <laughs> and you know, the eyes bug out. What? We're eating shrimp, you know, and this shrimp is spitting out. What is this? Because I was serious. I said, I know where he lives. What are you telling me? I said, it was always been an unlisted number, so I don't know if we want to give it out. What could it be? What could it be that here we have 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, these people in Egypt saying Jesus gave them this number. What's the number? 4555. What the heck is that? And then you find out 4555 is a galaxy in the constellation Virgo the Virgin. An unnamed galaxy with a bright center, sharply defined features. What else could it be? And so you wonder if they come in UFOs or if people have come, you can I know exactly where they come from. They come from 4555. And not only can you say 4555, we have the coordinates for 4555. You can look on the star map and pinpoint exactly where it is. How much more can you do? So I'm telling everybody, there it is. We've solved the mystery. We know exactly where they all live. 
and everybody sits and stares at you. Huh? <sighs> <sighs> what is this? What do you have to do? It doesn't work. No matter what anybody tells anybody, nobody cares. Nobody wants it. Because they can't believe anything. You have lived all of your life and been taught in churches so much absolute baloney that no matter what happens, if Jesus walks through the door and says, here I am, say, okay, I can't come in this afternoon because I have to go to the soccer game. <laughs> it's impossible. See? So what happens then? You just have to be caught up in the experience, as the quantum say. You just have to suddenly find, here I go. You don't even know whether it's anybody's second coming, third coming, whether they came or whatever. It's irrelevant. So anyhow, the eyes and the back give you an understanding of what life, how it was put together. The eyes in the front as to what is come. Clarity of thinking and mind of crystal. The awesome power of the right side. So you have the description of the four beasts. Cosmic and human. See? And it takes us directly to the zodiac. Look at Revelation 4. Are you there? Verse 7. The first beast was like a Leo, okay? And the second beast was like a calf. Well, why a calf? Why, why, you know, because it's the child quality. Why didn't Jesus ride a donkey? He didn't, he rode a foal, the child of the donkey, see? It's important the animal nature is a calf or a child because it's the child of promise within you. And the third beast had the face of a man. Aquarius. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Aquila. Scorpio. Okay. So here we have the human condition firmly attached to the mysteries of the zodiac. So now before you open these seals, I want you to understand something. You learn that you're involved in it, the Kundalini, the Om and all. You learn that the cosmos is involved in it. And you also learn the zodiac's involved in it. Sorry. Now, were you with me a minute ago when we went to see Ezekiel about the crystal, about the spaceship, the UFO? Come with me again. Go back to page 678 and look at Ezekiel chapter one, and he's talking about the spaceship again, this, uh, this UFO. I mean, I don't, you call it a UFO because it's a, something that flew. It was an object that flew, and it was unidentified. So it's an unidentified flying object. Is that an unidentified fly? If you see something flying, it's an object. It's a flying object. Is that hard for you to deal with? Anybody here object that an object that's flying is a flying object? <laughs> okay, I'll deal. I'll buy that. <coughs> Glory to God for that. <laughs> And if you can't identify it, then it would be called an unidentified flying object. <laughs> That's what happened here. Okay, this guy saw an object that was flying. But look what he did. In Ezekiel chapter 1, look what verse 10 says. And as for the likeness of their faces, they had the face of a man, and the face of a lion, and the face of an ox. There's a different thing of the bull tourist. And the face of an eagle. So there you had the four prime cardinal signs there. Not only attached to the Kundalini saying, hey, pay attention to the zodiac when you get involved in this, but also the zodiac attached to this UFO that Ezekiel saw. Don't try to digest the whole thing now, except there's a connection here, folks. There's a connection, say. Now, remember I talked to you about, I hope you, if you can give me a few more minutes, because I... I'm just trying not to rush, but at the same time. Remember I talked to you about the construction of the tabernacle? And you remember God said to Moses, make this in a pattern because there's something in there that's a pattern of something that exists. And he said, make an outer court and make a holy place and separate the two by a curtain. And then we found in Stedman's Dictionary that your brain has an outer covering called dura mater, which is hard mother. And the most sensitive part of your brain, the inner part, is called pia mater, which is tender mother. And the dura mater and pia mater are separated by arachnoid, which is the web or curtain. 
meaning that the tabernacle, which is not built with human hands, is described in the Bible and described in Stedman's Dix Medical Dictionary exactly. The tabernacle is your head. Okay? Now, the reason I wanted to bring that to you is because, are you, are you still in Ezekiel? You're still here. <laughs> okay. Uh, would you go to page 715? And on page 715, Ezekiel has a little change. He's away now from the, the UFO for a moment. And he's gone into this holy place, which is the tabernacle. And we know that the tabernacle is your head. And in uh, Ezekiel chapter 41 and in verse uh, 17, look what he says. To that above the door, even unto the inner house. Well, the inner house is pia mater. Pia mater is the inner part of the brain. Okay? Um, and in verse 18, it was made with cherubims. Now remember, the cherubim are what he identified, the fellow getting out in the white suit of the UFO as cherubim. So now we have a connection with the UFO and the brain. What I'm telling you here is that people who have seen UFO, for whatever reason, have had an experience of consciousness and really have. You, ma you manufacture, bad word, these things manifest when the conditions are right here, for whatever reason. It's like uh, Gary Zukov said in or one of them on the Zen meditation or whatever that book was, a cosmic sense or whatever the heck was, uh, Zen physics, that any person, if you've never meditated before, if you don't even know what meditation is or anything like that, but the conditions are right at a particular time for whatever reason, bang, you have the experience. Okay, so we go into this tabernacle and we see this cherubim. And now we look at 4118, a cherubim, a cher and every cherub had two faces. Do you see that? Every cherub had two faces. Look at verse 19. The face of a man towards the palm tree on one side, Aquarius. All right? Face of a man on the palm tree to one side, Aquarius and the face of a young lion on the palm tree to the other side, Leo. So here we have the intellect, the mind, the man, Aquarius. That's your brain. And then we have the pineal gland, the source of the opening of the crown chakra, Leo. Daniel describes the beast in his description of the lowest nature. He said there's four great beasts, the lion, which was Leo, Scorpio, and so forth in the same way. He also saw a bear and a leopard. So in Revelation, then, we see the beasts who provide an opposite to the lower beasts that are in Daniel. We see in Revelation the beasts of, of the higher consciousness, which now we understand the four points of the, of, of the compass. Let me, look, let me look just for a minute, because so, I want to show you, and, and then we're out of here. I wanted to show you, and I, I was going to skip this, and then just inside of me it said, don't skip what you wrote. Because I wrote this down, I was going to skip this because of the fact that I, wanted, I didn't want to keep it too long. Mistake. And I was just told that. Isn't it amazing? Somebody just said, that's fine. you skip that, don't skip that. Okay. <laughs> So let's not skip that. We get this guy ticked off and we got a lot of trouble here. 45, 55, you ain't seen nothing yet. Here we go. Page 730. I can't skip that. That's amazing. I know you don't know what the heck I'm talking about. You say this guy's taking comes out of spasms up on the stage up there. But I was just, a voice spoke to me as clear as if I had heard you. And the voice says to me, you skip that, don't skip that. Yeah. And I'll, yeah. I won't skip that. You've heard from, uh, where am I? 7.30. 730 what? Oh, Daniel chapter 7. Okay. That was quite an experience I had. Yes. Yeah, I'm all myself, I'm looking at you and a guy yells in my ear. Daniel chapter 7, verse, and you know what, some, it, uh, only because I, I choose that most of you people here understand that I could say that. I couldn't say that. You know, if there was somebody here for the first time, they're out of here. 
but you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Daniel chapter 7, verse 3. And the four great beasts came up from the sea. Now these are, these are the same beasts that you see in Revelation, but they're the lower nature. Don't forget, everything is a duality. Remember what I told you, the electricity can make it nice and warm in here and can give you light and you can play music and everything. But if you screw it up and it'll burn the place down. So, I mean, there's a duality. Okay, you got the four great beasts. Look at verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. So we have the combination here. Leo and Scorpio. Maybe we'll have to get one of our people that are into astrology to tell me what, what you think that would mean. I don't even know. I didn't, even, I didn't dwell with it that far. Go to verse 5. Behold another beast like a bear. And look what it was doing. It had three ribs in its mouth between the teeth. I mean, this was, this was devouring the flesh. You know what it's saying? It's like, it's like Taurus and the lower nature. It rips you apart. And it's not that your friends are ripping you apart. It's like, remember what Buddha said? Buddha said, you know, you have a person and somebody comes up to him and they cause some trouble and the person's like, you're always coming around here and stirring stuff up, Gloria. Always coming. Everything is nice. Everything is calm. Then you come in and start shooting your mouth. I'm stirring up. You got me crazy. <laughs> now, Buddha said, wait a minute. If you have sediment in your cup, then somebody else can stir that cup and the water is going to get dirty. But if you've purged the sediment out of your cup, they can stir all day long and that water will stay clean. So basically then, the beast is us and what's being devoured is us by us. By ourselves. See? Because we're dwelling down with the beast. The six, verse six, and then I beheld another like a leopard which had on its back four wings. And also had four heads and so forth. But the leopard is a symbol of what? Confusion. Why? Because it's truth mingled with error because of the black and white spots. I didn't make that up. I mean, you can look at gas scales or whatever. That's why it's a leopard in the book. Because a leopard is a symbol of confusion because of all the different, the different spots. See. And it says in verse 7, this strong and exceedingly the iron teeth and so forth and so on, and it was diverse from all the beasts of the before, and it had the ten horror. This is the unnamed horror, the dark time of the soul. And you've all gone through it. Some of you have gone through it recently. You've felt all of this stuff. You're scared to death. But in Revelation now, as we prepare to open the seven seals, it's a whole different thing. It's, it's those same four beasts. You have the eagle, you have the lion, you, you, you have the man, and you, and you have the, the bull. And, but, but they're in a positive state now. They're with that, that UFO or whatever it is, and, and they're here now as, as we're getting ready to embark on opening these seven seals. And the beasts of Daniel we just read about were the fear, the beasts of Revelation restored, saved us out of this with the lion, the sun, sitting at the right side. So these are, these are tough things to do, I know, in, in working through the pre-opening of the seals, but, you know, it's necessary for us to do this, and you'll be greatly rewarded when we get to uh, chapter 6 of Revelation. You'll be greatly rewarded, and you will see how the knowledge that you're accumulating now will help you, uh, op help you so much when you take that envelope in your hand and, and shake to open the first seal. And then as it opens and it pours out onto you and the understanding that you'll have because of this. And it was just like, see, uh, what happened to me a few moments ago is that when we're given these things, we can't jump because of trying to save time or anything like that. Uh, and, but yet I'm very grateful that we're so close to to the, to the instructors of this message that, you know, they would intervene instantly. Um, it, it, I, it, it's very hard sometimes to understand how these things happen, but you, you have to realize that, you know, we communicate, uh, we have a transmitter in here, it's just absolutely, we don't know the power of it, the power of its ability to heal, the power of its ability to communicate, and it's such a power. And, and it, and it, you know, and it moves into the universe and the universe moves back. What is it? 
it is, remember we talked about it and then I'm done. It is that which causes a receptor in your brain to arc with electrical signal from one point to another. And it depends whether the angle is coming this way, whether it's coming this way, whether it's coming this way. And so that is who I heard from just a moment ago would be the angle of the arc of electricity or the arc angle. And that's why they use those words. It's the archangel, is the, it's the arc that is the electric and the angle that it comes in. And it depends, as I said, the angle that it comes in will cause you to feel and think differently. So we've moved that much closer to the seals and opening them and uh, we'll go from there. I may be, it depends on the announcement that comes through we see on the computer, I may be uh, necessary to, I'm, I'm hoping we don't interfere with this. That's why it left me saying, what do I do? Because if we announce the seventh planet fully, and we get into that, I don't want to get you off or get myself off course on what we're doing here. <coughs> so I may let that, that planet thing go until we complete this because I think at least complete Revelation 4, which we're not far from. Because it's important, you know, and, 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 and what we're doing, we're treating each other as adults and understanding these things. But it's very important. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll, uh, we'll see you back. Bye-bye. <laughs>